had we been compelled to to Instagram that, you know, where, where we, we hike miles into the Yellowstone wilderness, we jump in a lake, we crawl out of the lake, and we just lie in the grass together and just breathe in a moment. And then we hike back in the dark, build a fire, and fail to sing Old Lang Syne because it's August 1st, 1994. Um <laughs> That's such a, and you know, my, my journal rendering of that moment is a little bit overwrought a little bit, but it was just so full of feeling. Like I realized how important those moments are. And I hope that people, yeah. especially young people who are having trips like this, uh, in this day and age, allow themselves to have those moments where they just experience them because that just feels so important and so essential. And reading that bit from my journal just makes me realize what, a blessing that whole year was. Welcome to Deviate with Rolf Potts, where I talk with experts, public figures, and interesting people about fascinating topics that meander off topic. Today, I talk about what was probably the most essential and soul-altering journey of my life, specifically an eight-month van trip around North America that I took 25 years ago in 1994 when I was 23 years old. It was my first real vagabonding trip, and if I hadn't have done it, I never would have become a world traveler and travel writer, at least not in the same way I am now. now. Earlier this year, I digitized and reread my travel journal from that year, and I was amazed by the joys and anxieties of my younger, less experienced travel self. I really wanted to dig deeper into this life-altering trip, if nothing else because I wanted to remind myself of what I experienced and what was at stake all those years ago, back when I was traveling in the hopes of getting travel out of my system because I was worried that life might not give me another chance to do it again. Now in 2019, living and traveling by van is its own trend with its own van life hashtag social media following. And I talk a bit about that in this episode, but my aim here isn't to analyze van life or systematically compare it to what I experienced 25 years ago. Granted, there are practical insights into van travel in this episode, but for the most part, I just aim to remember and celebrate an old journey by a much younger version of myself. Helping me in this recollection is my good friend Jeff Neenaber, who made that van trip with me back in the day. Together, we talk about planning the journey, converting the van, and making a travel routine, but for the most part, we just compare notes on what we experienced. And really, for all the technical van life information that's out there these days, the point of traveling by van is to make your life richer, and that certainly happened for us. Jeff and I were in our early 20s when we took this adventure, so there's a lot of young man details in here. Lots of partying and staying up late and obsessing about the future. But we also did volunteer work in various cities and read lots of books and spent a lot of time exploring national parks. When I took this trip, I'd hoped to write a book about it, and I did try to do that, but I'm not all that surprised that the book never really turned out, since this journey was about the raw experience and personal learning of the trip, more so than garnering insight and wisdom to share with others. And in fact, I think I needed a few more years and a lot more international travel experience before I'd eventually learn what I needed to write my first book, Vagabonding. Still, this van trip was so essential for all its youthfulness and messiness, and Jeff and I managed to cover a lot of ground in our conversation, not just the hows and wares of our van life experience, but also what it was like to travel in an area before smartphones or social media or even email. We talk about all the anxieties we felt at the beginning of the trip and why we're glad we didn't limit the journey to beaches and national parks. We talk about friends who visited us along the way and how they enhanced our trip. We talk about the unique experiences we've found for ourselves, like staying with monks at a Trappist monastery in Massachusetts, or riding along with a police shift in Houston, or volunteering at an African-American church in Mississippi, or even just visiting the city of New York for the first time in our lives. By the way, because of length edits I made to this episode, Jeff and I talk about our friend Lauren, the guy who visits us in Florida without really introducing who he is. And later on, we allude to experiences in Philadelphia without really explaining what we did there. Jeff and I ended up reminiscing on Skype for almost four hours, so in the end, I had to edit things down a bit to make things more manageable in length. Still, this ends up being one of the most personal episodes I've ever done for this podcast, which is exactly what makes it interesting to listen to. This episode is brought to you by Tortuga, the backpack brand I used when I traveled around the world on my most recent vagabonding journey. Check out a variety of their backpack models at rolfpotts.com tortuga, and if you see a pack you like, you can get 10% off your order by using the promo code DEVIATE. 
This episode was also brought to you by AirTrax, which I used to plan my round-the-world flight itinerary in 2019. And for almost 30 years now, AirTrax has specialized in multi-stop itineraries for vagabonding-style journeys. Check out their trip planning tools at AirTrax.com. But for now, please listen in as my old friend Jeff and I talk about the van journey that changed our lives 25 years ago. 25 years ago, as many of you in my audience probably know, I traveled across America by van in what was my first vagabonding experience. This was five years before I took my first big Asia vagabonding experience. And this was such an essential key part of of my travel career. And I talk about it a lot. I often talk about it when I'm giving presentations in the context of of my first vagabonding experience, and I talk about traveling with different combinations of friends, and that's true, but one friend who traveled with me the entire time, and in fact was a very key part of organizing the trip from the get-go, is my friend Jeff Neighbor, who I have on for this episode. Jeff, how you doing, man? I'm well, Rolf. Thanks for having me. It's uh, it's going to be a fun trip down memory lane, that's for sure. Absolutely. Now, tell me, just so people know, tell us a little bit about, about yourself. Where do you live and what do you do? I work for the largest software company in the world in the Pacific Northwest, um, and I do advertising and raise three girls. So uh, a little bit different than the the life we're going to recall right now. Yeah, and what I love about that is that I sort of became, before the concept of a digital nomad came into the parlance of our times, I sort of became this travel writer, digital nomad guy, where you, who went on the very same trip and went through a lot of the same experiences, Went on and became a normal guy with with a wife and kids. <laughs> <laughs> and so I think sometimes people are worried before a vagabonding trip that, they're, that it might ruin them somehow. Um, and you're you're yeah. a thriving you're a thriving uh, American dream type guy, unless I'm mistaken somehow. <laughs> well, that's what my LinkedIn profile would let you believe. <laughs> so we'll just go with that. Okay, well, I, there's so much that we can dig in here, and it's been 25 years, and it's and it's. Um, I have revisited my journals. I I converted them to text, and I sent them to you. So I know that you've been thinking about yeah. this a lot recently. And there's just like we don't have you know a proper 16 hours to talk about everything, but I hope we can cover <laughs> most of the bases. But before I get into our trip specifically, are you familiar with the hashtag Van Life phenomenon on Instagram? <laughs> uh, no, I. Uh... I, I, yeah, software, advertising, raising girls. Um, I, I envision it's like thug life for white people, but no, no <laughs> idea. Well, it's funny that you say that because that's exactly where the where the phrase come from. So this guy like took the old Tupac tattoo and made van life for the lifestyle he was living in. This was, I think, <laughs> he created this hashtag in 2011, and as of last fall, as of 2018. It had had more than 4 million hashtags on Instagram, and it sort of became this thing. And the funny thing is, even though you and I took a van trip around America 25 years ago, people talk about hashtag van life like it's a trend that's less than 10 years old, and the only thing before <laughs> van life was was a few crusty hippies, like in the 60s and 70s. And it's like, dude... Oh, that's- that's charming. Me and my yes. friend Jeff were just normal guys, and and we were living, we were, we dreamt of travel, and we we weren't really hippies, and we weren't really digital nomads. We were just trying to figure out our lives. So, um, just so you know, and just so the audience has a frame of reference, and I think maybe a lot of people who are listening, they may, some people may have done some van travel themselves, but a lot of people know about this lifestyle through its sort of trend magazine piece trend as a hashtag that's really blown up in recent years and it's it's people with some good ideas including minimalism and working from the road and um oftentimes it's started by people who live in expensive cities like san francisco who decide to live right. in the van for a while and then later travel during weekends and then maybe have, be full-time van dwellers and there's it, it's so popular that there's even a backlash. It's sort of like a it's it's this hipster trend with its own backlash, and that's because a lot of times these images that show up in hashtag van life pictures on Instagram are over idealized. I mean, the vans look like boutique apartments. There's a lot of craftsmanship that goes into them, and we'll get to this in a second. But our, ours did not look like a boutique apartment. <laughs> but um, there was it, no potpourri. There, there's no potpourri, and it was. It's a little bit of an older demographic. It's often couples, and often 
these this van life hashtag will show like the woman doing yoga poses or like showing her butt in a swimsuit um <laughs> or like like the dude fixing things under the hood or like um designing their special toilet which makes you think why on earth would you put a toilet in a van when you could when you can oh, stop at a gas God. station <laughs> so i don't want to <laughs> I think people who are really into van life, they know that it's not just about idealized butt shots and special composting toilets, that there actually is a challenge and a system to living from a, from this on the road. Um, but I think among the many ways that our trip was different was that it happened in 1994. And so now people, they spend a lot of time looking for Wi-Fi. They work from the road in a way that may not have been possible back for us. They They look for special places to camp using... Google Maps, um, and I love it. And when I read about it, it makes me miss the van life I knew 25 years ago. But I just don't know if our trip is directly translatable to how van life happens now, in part because we were pretty young. We weren't about trying to, to create Instagram followers and be in influencers. Yeah. Um, we kept private journals, but really we were a couple of guys who were trying to make the most of their young lives at a time when we were, when we'd either graduated from college or dropped out of college. So uh, let's mm. talk about it. Wow, lots to talk about. It, it, that sounds definitely orthogonal to our experience and what we were able to do with technology or weren't able to do with technology and kind of even the motivation. We were definitely not trying to uh, make a career or, or advance any cause or, or create any network other than just, you know, meeting people. Um, and we sure like we reveled in just being disconnected a lot. I mm. think getting, getting out in the wilderness, um, and, you know, maybe snapping five photographs in an entire week, um, in a backcountry experience. Um, uh, but just because we were trying to capture the beauty of something for ourselves, not, not for anybody else. Well, that have that ex experience um, just just for us, right? And sort of at the beginning of our lives versus for any any other objective. Yeah, that occurred to me that we traveled, depending on how you count, about seven and a half or eight months of yeah. living in the van. And a single photo from hashtag van life is better than every photo we took in those seven and a half or eight months. <laughs> like, I, I love looking at my old photos, but yeah, just like... Too. Um, the, 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 uni more. the universality of the photos that we took, they were just sort of underpinning this very private experience, yep. um, that we were undertaking. And so I'm, I'm really curious, um, I can share my motivations and thoughts about it in a minute, but what, what was your motivation for doing this trip? Because you actually were still in the middle of college and you decided to take time off from college, um, to make it happen. So what we, what were you thinking? What made you want to live in a van? and travel America for, for a little short of a year? I probably asked myself that question a thousand times. And then in the last couple of weeks, digging up journals, knowing that this was on the calendar and we were going to go down memory lane, I, I tried to you know articulate it, you know, something that would roll well on a podcast. And I don't know if I can. I mean, I think there's a million different reasons. I think I was heavily influenced by a couple of my uncles who did it on motorcycles. You know, they were full on hippies. Um, you know, you and I had, so many conversations about, um, you know, just going and, and just doing and, and being different than sort of the playbook or the script that most people in college or the, at least the college we were at were, were sort of operating their lives under. Um, and then, you know, I think there's, there's so many reasons, just adventure, fun, just that energy we had, we had to channel it somewhere. It, uh, it was just, it, it meant to be. And I think the, the notion of, you know, every guy, like if they're honest and, and when they're that young and there's so much youth and vitality in them, they just want to go that, you know, there's no Pacific Ocean to, to conquer and find out what's on the other side anymore. You know, the the moon has been landed and, you know, not to equate us with those types of adventures, but that's in everybody. Right. To jump on a pirate ship and, and sail away and, and go, you know, be raiders and uh, and live uh, an adventurous part of your life. And uh I just think it was that. I don't know if it, I know I joked often uh, with you and others just to, to get off the subject that I was just trying to avoid a midlife crisis and, uh, and, and live that moment when I could when I was young and when it would be uh, the most in the moment 
and the most authentic versus, you know, when it's older and, and could potentially be more contrived or social media ready. Um, but I, I mean, I think there's something to that. Like if you don't use your youth when you have it, you lose it. And I think we both tapped into that pretty young. Yeah. Yeah. I, I remember having, um, well, I, th- I think we met maybe you transferred into my that college in Oregon in about 91, <laughs> 90, it was yeah. 91. Exactly. And, and yeah. I think you New talked year. about your yeah. uncles and I had read like blue highways by William least heat moon, which is sort of a middle-aged man's van travel mm-hmm. book. But that had sort of captured my imagination. Jack Kerouac's On the Road captured my imagination a little bit, but that just seemed so disorganized. Like, I wasn't sure if I could be a wild man like Jack (laughs) Kerouac. But then also uh, um, John Steinbeck's Travels with Charlie, another middle-aged man book. Um, Those are my examples for for van life. And then there was a very specific moment in in the summer of 1991 when I was working at a grocery store uh, stocking shelves, and I just hated it so much. I hated this job so much that I realized that if I was in any job that I didn't like, it would be an extension of me stocking shelves. Um, and around well and around that time, um, you know, my my grandfather, who you met on that trip, you know, he was yeah. um, he was spending his retirement sort of cloistered at home on his farm because his wife, my grandmother, had Alzheimer's disease, and so it was a really sort of emotionally tough time for me that this 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 guy that I respected and loved so much didn't get to enjoy his retirement, which is the time when a America tells you that you're supposed to, you know, Mm. travel a little bit. And so I remember writing you letters back when that's how you communicated (laughs) um, and said, let's do a trip. And you're like, yeah, whatever. And and then slowly over the next three years, we talked about it and talked about it. And then we met once a week and made little plans and dreamed about it. And then in the summer of 91, um, we got landscaping jobs for your uncle uh, and we started saving money and we started. We got the van, and I think the deal was that that I paid for the gas for the whole trip, and you bought the van and and, and got it trip ready. So let's let's talk a little bit about that van. <laughs> was it an eighty five van again? Yeah, yeah, and it was ninety three. But I know where you're going there. Yes, um, it was uh, eighty five. Um, it was a ugly, ugly, but beautiful van. Right there was just no character to it. <laughs> it, was, it was an empty canvas. Um, it was like the, the most muted color of brown um, and uh, nothing but just these really uncomfortable bench seats. Then we, we realized we needed to convert a bed. I think we consulted with people. We got our my uncle to help construct it out of really, really thick plywood, which was probably way thicker than it needed to be. But well, we um, took the bench. Case, we took the bench seats out. Took the benches out. Took there was a discussion out. Yeah. of the yeah. Westphalia, which is sort of a, a camper van version of the Vanagon, which is more expensive but oh, it, yeah. it's a, it's also a little bit, it sort of makes your plan for you. And we just wanted to be super simple. So we took out those two bench seats. We got inch and an eighth plywood and a piano hinge with the help of yeah. your Uncle Paul. That's right. And, and we installed a, a folding bed with a little foam pad on it. So during the day, it was a bench. And during the night, it was a bed. Um, That's brilliant. What other conversions was... did we do to that? So that was the bed. And then we realized, you know, we're going to want to have some privacy. So we constructed a brilliant um set of curtains that i actually sewed myself which wow. uh, i don't even remember how to sew but i remember figuring it out and bungee cords right because mm. you wanted it to expand and contract easily and uh, be something we could take off really quick and not be permanent because we didn't want it to uh, get in our way we could just toss it out of the way when we were driving there were also uh, velcro cr- curtains right there was the bungee there, cord there were... curtain that separated the front seat from the back of the van and then That's there was right. there was like five other windows that we had to custom design and by we i mean yep. probably you that's right we did had... the tearaway velcro on the sides of the van and yeah. the bungees were in the front Our, the plan was like we didn't put any insulation in the van but the plan was to start on new year's day and drive south and just find warmth as soon as possible and <laughs> <laughs> and and stay south until it warmed up and go north the spring and west with the summer and that pretty that's brilliant. much that's pr- that pretty much worked i know that we like we we each had a set of hiking boots and a set of running shoes and then like a maybe a four or five day rotation of clothes yeah. and i had a trangia camp stove and if anybody's ever used trangia it just uses i'm not sure what kind of alcohol it's, it doesn't burn very hot but we we must have eaten ramen and rice like a hundred thousand times that year, um, and oh, easily, easily. <laughs> that thing was that thing was a workhorse. I mean, we used that day in and day out. I mean, not just on the trail, but 
we're talking at gas station parking lots, hotels. Yeah. Uh, the thing was a workhorse. Public parks, and I don't think we ever fried anything in the stove. It was we just boiled water and made like ramen and rice. <laughs> maybe occasionally some mac and cheese. Maybe occasionally some I don't know, did coffee water or something. <laughs> but um, oh yeah, like cowboy coffee. Yeah, yeah, we we did. Yeah, I I uh, I think my my favorite as as I was looking through my old terrible handwritten notes. Um, first thing we did when we we rolled into Graceland was we found a a public parking stall and took over the sidewalk and made chili. Oh, nice. So nice. <laughs> why wouldn't you? God bless all of us. <laughs> yeah, chili. I, I forgot about that. I know that we made a lot of peanut butter and jelly. And in fact, sometimes yeah. in my journal, it says people would walk by on the street and say, they're eating peanut butter and jelly in there. <laughs> and we would have cereal in the mornings. And this is an old camping trip. We actually had powdered milk. Powdered we, milk. We would sprinkle on the cereal and then put water on the powdered milk on the cereal. And we were just, we were total dirtbags. Th this is, I mean, to, 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 to give away one of the stats, we, we did this whole trip, seven and a half or eight months. My bill was $5,000. And I yeah. think we got that because we very rarely ate out. Uh, we yeah. very rarely stayed in motels. I think we stayed in motels two or three times, and that was when we had friends visiting, and there was no room for yeah. them in the van. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I, I was I was baffled. I looked at the back of one of my journals, and it had sort of a a really embarrassing looking budget where I'd just write randomly, and sometimes I'd put how much we spent on a day. But yeah, five hundred bucks a month was was the max goal. And, you know, some days we'd get by on like $6. <laughs> yeah. Baffling. Well, gas was, was often under a dollar. And I and as I recall, in, in the coastal Georgia, we paid yeah. this, our cheapest gas was 79 cents a gallon, which probably doesn't exist anymore. Um, probably not. <laughs> and I think somewhere in the Carolinas, it was like 25 cent pack of cigarettes, which was like, for me, when I used to smoke, that was like, wow, we just saved a fortune. And and one great thing is that we were so young and poor that we didn't care. We were just so excited. And this is actually one thing, this is one deviation from van life. Like for all of the fancy people who build cabinets and special kitchens and toilets in their van life vans, it's like we slept in the van and we spent the entire time running around, hiking, meeting people. I mean, the the advantage of having sort of a sort of a nerdy dirtbag van is that we weren't tempted to hang out in there all the time. Yeah, well said. We we were uh, before it was hip. We were absolute minimalists, and uh, we we reveled in it because it actually forced us to have more of an adventure than we could ever imagine. I mean, who can even fathom today just rolling into a university or rolling into a hotel or rolling in anywhere and just assuming you belong there and acting like you belong there and using the the pools and the hot tubs and right. the continental breakfasts and the showers right and uh, just you know like it was meant to be for you to use um that if you if you have all those amenities in your hashtag van life i, I question you'll actually get out and meet people that uh are worth journaling about yeah well we had a big advantage that we were that we were basically college age and we were very comfortable on college campuses and so oftentimes we would go to a college campus and just use the athletic showers, for example, to yeah, clean up. And, sure. and if you if you follow hashtag van life online, showers are a big problem for people. And in fact, a lot of the like the bikini butt shots of the the handsome wife or the good looking <laughs> wife are are using a solar shower. Well, we didn't have a solar shower. We, we would just come on. We, we did w one of two things basically. One was either we would we would park in a in a motel parking lot because that was a lot yeah. that was full of out of state tags. Then another thing we did was um, was was universities. Um, and uh, I remember like places like Texas Lutheran, we would just go into the student center. We, we ended up sleeping on couches inside the student center. Um, oh yeah, you got permission to do that actually. Yeah, and, and, like, and, and we were rarely questioned, you know. I, I mean, I, I think that there is, you know, just what they would call now a racial privilege thing going on here. I remember when we were in sure. Memphis, right after we'd been in Canton, Mississippi, and I wanna talk about Canton in a second. We were hanging out with this dude, Keith. He's like a street busker playing the buckets. Great guy. He'd like would have been in our circle of friends back in college. 
easy to get along with. And we're sort of telling him about the trip and how awesome it is and how we're sleeping on campuses. But Keith was black, right? And he said, you guys are, you guys are crazy. There's no way. <laughs> There's no way I could walk in and eat a continental be- breakfast. And it's like, oh, yeah. So, yeah. It's, so it's funny how we got those, we got those lessons, you know, that um, – that uh, for as much as we swaggered in and got our free continental breakfast and slept in parking lots, there were times when we realized that that was actually a privilege that we had as as young white men. So, oh, for sure. I mean, we we were extremely privileged, and I think you know the culture was a bit naive. I think after we got back a couple of years later, there were some pretty serious events on on a couple of different campuses in the South that uh, you know from drifters in, in air quotes. And, uh, you know, that kind of locked down every major college campus and security guards started to take it up to a new level, but even, even hotels now, it's at a completely different level. I was, I was looking back at, at one adventure, um, in the South and we're in some unknown hotel and you were approached by one of the managers and asked if we were guests and right. we had a plan. We had a planned response. I remember that, it. Yeah, we're we're here with our grandma. Yes, that's what we told them. <laughs> and it worked. I don't yeah. know where we came up with that, but uh, I don't think that would work nowadays. I think they'd want to see your ID. Yeah, Otherwise. well, they they have um, you know CCTV cameras, yeah, and and, and exactly. campuses are are just a little bit twitchier. Uh, and so that might be one of one on the short list of things that we couldn't do as easily anymore. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, in, for in, sure. In this day and age. But it's funny that, again, that I was reading the, the hashtag van lifers complaining about the shower situation and how they, they would like join Planet Fitness so they could shower. And I'm thinking, we never had that problem. But it's because we were constantly yeah. like swimming in, a, in the Sheraton pool and then like soaping up in the bathroom and, and, and driving <laughs> off. I mean... And our standards were pretty damn low. I mean, our our two days in Vegas, we bathed in a jacuzzi. So right, right. I'm sure we, I'm sure we were pretty, uh, pretty rancid by by today's terms as well. Yeah. So if you saw two like reddish haired guys with a with a chlorine <laughs> scent, that was us <laughs> in 1994. Um, Somehow it, it didn't hurt the uh, ability to meet meet people, certain kinds of people. That's true, and that's something I want to get into too because. So many times when I'm reading my journal, we would just go up and start talking to people. And it feels like now, you know, especially young people and at that age, especially young women our age. And yeah. people look at their phones so much that I think they look for social interaction. And I'm not I'm not disparaging how it works. I'm just saying this is the difference is that in 1994, it was perfectly normal to just go up and talk to somebody. Maybe it still is. But these yeah. days, people are default to phone mode so much that it feels like a lot of those delightfully spontaneous situations um, would be less likely to happen. Um, oh yeah. I just, I, I, I don't think the trip we did, I don't think that adventure would be possible unless you, you literally left your phone at home. I mean, just this, the urgency to meet people and the patience required to figure out where the hell you're at and what you should be doing, which God bless you, Potts, man, you've always been super diligent and, and, um, you know, finding and figuring out the right plan and, and, you know, research, research, research. But, oh, my gosh, can you imagine doing that today without a cell phone? Well, yeah. I don't yeah. think anybody would. We, we just had – we had a road atlas. I think I still have it. Yep. And that's how we it's found beautiful atlas, everything. Yeah. We There was no printout map quest like in 2003. There was no Google Maps like there is now. We just We just – made phone calls and looked things up on the Atlas. And it's, and it's funny that you mentioned me being diligent somewhere in my diary. I, I mentioned that you're sort of the Kirk of the expedition and I'm sort of the Spock, right? Like I'm <laughs> I, like, I was sort of the navigator who, who figured things out and called ahead and, and sort of rationally made sense of things. And, and, and actually I, I thought of this when I, when I approached you to, to uh, that in the summer of 91 to travel with me is that you, you're like sort of the one, you're a good driver and two, you're sort of charismatic and people like you. And, and, um, and so I think that's part of why we were a good team is I, I'm the guy who figured out we were, where we were going and, and you were this guy who could put people at ease wherever we went. I think, I think I'm just enough of an introvert that I would have spent more time in that, in that dirt bag van than I, than I needed to, um, <laughs> Uh, I love how you, I love how you see life. I was thinking about it as uh, I'm I'm just a you know go go go, and you're like yes, and let's go there, which is really really important. 
And, uh, you know, I think our intentional path that was weather compliance, I think our use of time and, and access to things like parks and history and culture and the ridiculous experiences like riding with police officers. Um, I w- this trip would not have happened if you hadn't been the guy who said, yes, but let's go there. So it, it was a balance, man. That's for sure. Yeah, and, and and those of you listening who are thinking about maybe partnering up for a, for a van type trip is find somebody who compliments you a little bit, you know, because um, because I was, you know, I, I I thought about those things, and and we'll get to this in a second. We stayed in a monastery; it's one of my favorite places, things, experiences yeah. of the whole trip, and that's just something that occurred to me. So I was I was sort of obsessing on these little details and making decisions. And and you were more of a happy go lucky guy who who drove well. I guess I was sort of a I guess I was sort of a Kerouac and you were a Cassidy, but really I was more of a Spock you and, and you were more of a Kirk. There's a Either couple. Way, we'll take it. I yeah. praise. I just I need I need me a blue lady right now. <laughs> exactly. Is it blue or green? I don't I don't remember that. I think that's a either name. one. We're, we're dating ourselves. I think. <laughs> um, but there's a couple more big picture things that I want to um, touch on before we get into some of these specific uh, stories because really. In spite of all the hashtag van life um, emphasis on beautiful images and beautifully kitted out vans, man, the experience is what makes van life what it is. And we had so many yeah. amazing experiences. And I want to get into some specifics, but a couple of more big picture items um, is that Taco Bell was <laughs> was our go to <laughs> restaurant. Like we didn't eat out much, but in my journal I tallied it. We ate at Taco Bell thirty three times. In seven, oh my god! <laughs> seven and a half months. <laughs> <laughs> and again, it could be a young man thing, but it was just, it was this ritual wow. that we just savored and it was, and it's cheap oh, yeah. and simple and fairly healthy. And we just ate at Taco Bell incessantly. Yeah. If, uh, yeah, I, I can't imagine doing that now. It's like super size me. I, I would be dead at 30 instead of 31. But what? if I would say, I would say if, if Waffle House was more, distributed across the u.s back in 1994 i think we would have maybe balanced that out a little bit because we did damage at waffle house as well that's true and and waffle house was very much a manifestation of the south it still is but we had no idea what it was we just we thought it was such a ridiculous sounding restaurant that we went there (laughs) and then it turned out that the next town in the south had a waffle house and the next house so the next town it's it's, just so it's it's a fly strip man it's a it's a food fly strip it's amazing i loved it one thing, one amazing thing about our shower situation too is that we ran so much that in the month of June we ran every day. That we just wow. um, we would wake up in a freaking van, we would put on our running shoes and run at least twenty minutes for thirty days in a row. I think there's maybe out of maybe two hundred and twenty days on the trip, we maybe ran two hundred of those days, which is just amazing. I'm I'm just wow. so much lazier now. I don't run that much anymore. <laughs> Yeah, wow. I mean, that was that was also credit to you too, and uh, and just saying, hey, we're not going to be big lumps of turd on this trip. We're gonna we're gonna make sure we go out and do something active, and we started that discipline early, and then it got to be a discipline, and then we needed it. And uh, it's also, I mean, what a great way to see. I remember um, in Canton, and then I remember in Georgia and outside of Atlanta and the suburbs, and just it, it, you cross the tracks, right? Like you go to a different part of town and you run through it and it, you see it completely differently than when you're, you know, in your van or in your car. So it ended up being an incredibly valuable experience. And who knew, you know, cause we were defiling our bodies the rest of the time <laughs> we were awake for sure. Smoking and drinking and general revelry, right? Yeah. Well, we'll get into that in a second, but like there's in Philadelphia, we got home at like five o'clock in the morning every day like we were out till five o'clock every day and it's funny that you mentioned canton because you can learn a lot not just geographically but culturally by going for a run and so when we were in canton we were staying with this church that did like a housing ministry and a racial reconciliation ministry which in mississippi obviously there's a big need for racial reconciliation and before we went running our hosts who were black said um yeah, you should be careful here. And we're like, oh, it's okay, it's okay. We're not afraid of black people and they're here. No, no, <laughs> you should be careful here because it doesn't matter what race there are. There's just bad people in this neighborhood. Yeah. Um, and so that was interesting how in a neighborhood where we had become comfortable because of our hosts, 
they were warning us, you know, in spite of our sudden racial idealism, that there's just, it's just good common sense advice, and we wouldn't have known about it had we not been going for runs every day. Um, exactly. And so this is a good bit of travel advice for people considering the same thing, that a run can give you an experience of a place that driving or even hiking through it won't. So, um, Absolutely. And we also, uh, we, we were ahead of the time from a CrossFit perspective, too, because we, we would hit uh, parks and high schools and do push-ups and pull-ups and all sorts of other things just to uh, keep ourselves active. That, uh, I remember, led to some interesting conversations and some pickup basketball games and things like that, too. That's true. We played a lot of pickup basketball. There was a lot of times when, like, very local dudes, it was usually dudes, would come start running yep. with us. Like, middle-aged men would, would like, prove, <laughs> prove it to themselves that they could hang with the young guys. And, yep. um and and it's really amazing how running every day made us more social people. It made us it made us yeah. fit people for sure. And you know, I was yeah. a competitive runner in college and you weren't, but I think yeah. that we kept kept each other honest because you 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 just sort of liked the discipline. And so on days when I was lazy, you would say, "Are we going to run?" and and then <laughs> on, on other days I would suggest that we would run too. So let's let's yeah. dig into some of the specifics of the trip. Um we started in Oregon, in Newburgh, Oregon, where we went to college and we went south with January down into California, and our first big stop was Mardi Gras, uh, which was in early February that year. And I don't, I don't even know why. We'll get to this in a second. I don't know why we were attracted to Mardi Gras in that pre-internet era, but we just somehow. <laughs> why wouldn't we be? <laughs> through through osmosis, we knew that we were supposed yeah. to go to Mardi Gras. But early on, I remember it was very rainy, and we didn't really know what we were doing. And I remember feeling a lot of anxiety on those first few days. Yeah. Oh, gosh, me too. I mean, I think my first couple of days are like, uh, what the hell? Think more before you do things like this, you know? Like, yeah. where are you? <laughs> it's, it's just so random. And, uh, you know, it, it definitely it took a little bit for us to kind of get in the rhythm and, and realize, well, we're out here doing this and uh, we can kind of do whatever we want. You know, that it, crazy, but it, it hadn't really dawned on me for, I don't know, several, several days. Um, that, you know, we, we could literally do whatever we wanted and, uh, you know, no one was going to stop us. So I think it took a while. And, uh, you know, the notion that we were probably a little idealistic in our expectations that it was all going to be about peaks. And so, you know, of course, Mardi Gras and spring break, and we're going to do all these crazy things, but there was a lot of valleys or, or, you know, maybe not valleys, but there were, there was a lot of downtime and there was a lot of random conversations with you know total strangers and small experiences like you know tagging along with fifth graders in a museum on their class field trip you know mm. just super random small experiences that um you know aren't aren't about the the, the big peaks and the mountaintops but were in, at least in my journal and my recollection and experience were super important to to the whole trip and I think that's normal. I think if you look at a van life Instagram, you can forget that so much of the trip is washing your dishes or putting up the curtains for the night. <laughs> exactly. Find Laundry mats. A, a place to park. And actually, yep. uh, I'll read a bit from my journal. Early on, in just those first few days, I put so much idealism and hope into the trip. And then, totally. Yeah. And then Oregon in January is just the rainiest place in the world. And so I said, as it got <laughs> darker and we could hardly see what we were eating, I began to feel a bit depressed. There is no outstanding reason why. I just think I've been conditioned to cr crave light, even indoor lighting. When you think about it, the only times in life where I spent functional time in the dark is when I'm sleeping. Consequently, Jeff and I feel like crashing every day at sunset. Perhaps we should get a plan of action so that we can make use of these post-sundown hours. Either way, when sleeping in the valley, we certainly do get to bed in decent time. So we literally didn't know what to do. <laughs> when it got dark, we were just oh, we were we were I so used it. to living indoors all that time that um, that uh, it was it was weird. But I, I think that's a good thing to acknowledge again for people who might be yeah. thinking about this, is that you really have to figure it out. And for all the, the the dreams that go into the adventures, the first few days are just figuring it out. You know, yeah, um, exactly. Getting your routine exactly. down. And so yep. we went through we went through California and we. Uh, Went through some, you know, we, we visited my sister who lived in Davis. We went to Berkeley to the Gilman Club, which is a famous punk rock club. I actually had, this is again, this is before the internet. I had a de an issue of Details Magazine that told like the best alternative clubs in America. And we saw a band called Rancid that night, or at least I think, 
Rancid played. I think we, we got we went into the club and then they we could watch like the first act and then they kicked us out because we didn't have enough money to play. But Rancid was just this little band there. People kept talking about how Green Day was this Berkeley band that was going to make it big and we're here. We yeah, what's Green Day? And of course, Green Day made it big later that year. Um, yeah. We went to I think Stanford was the first college where we figured out we could we could shower in the school. There was like a road race oh, yeah. that year and we got like some free energy bars. <laughs> we showered in yeah, the, in the sports right. building. Um, and, um, we went to like hate Ashbury and stuff, but I think that the big thing that happened to us in California was the North Ridge earthquake oh, yeah. of, of January. And, and, and this is, this is one of many 1994 specific details that, that really couldn't have happened any other year. It, it was the North Ridge earthquake, like 50 people died in that earthquake. Um, yeah. weirdly enough, we were staying in Brentwood, California, Uh, And so on a trip where sometimes like we would sleep once I slept in a horseshoe pit in Glenwood Springs, Colorado, because there were (laughs) because my friend Todd was with us and there wasn't room in the van. Um, Brentwood is is like a fancy people neighborhood. I was we were staying with the parents of a of the roommate of a friend of a friend and sweet, wonderful people. But just by random chance, we were in one of the wealthiest neighborhoods in Los Angeles during the Northridge quake of 1994. Um, yeah. And so there's this historical moment where we're basically standing in line for food at the Westward Ho, which has been half destroyed. Westward Ho is a supermarket with all these like film producers and stuff. Um, and Meredith Baxter Bernie. Was she That's at the, the Was she at the Westward Ho? The celebrity. <laughs> Michael J. Fox's mom. Yeah. Okay. Like, I, I remember all these random details and uh, and sitting there in the midst of all this wealth and just amazing fame and, and fortune and everybody was kind of reduced to standing in a line waiting for water. Yeah, it was pretty cool. I remember we went and stayed with my friend Josh who was going to school in Santa Clarita. We had to like to flush the toilet. We had to bring in water from the duck pond <laughs> outside. And when, when the earthquake happened, like I'd grown up my whole life hearing that like people from Los Angeles made fun of people in earthquakes for freaking out over nothing. Right. And so basically the bed is galloping across the room and I'm thinking, okay, I guess this is one of those LA earthquakes, <laughs> <laughs> but it was, it was hard. That's exactly, that's exactly what I had in my journal of like, Oh, yes. I, I woke up at four 30 in the morning, four thirty one, And you know, the, the giant wardrobe that was in this amazing room that we just got our own rooms. was like literally writhing across this huge bedroom. And I'm like, Oh, well, this would suck to live in LA. This is not fun. And then just kind of trying to go back to bed yeah, and not, not real, not realizing this was like the biggest earthquake in over a hundred years. Yeah. Our friend's not... mom had to come in and tell us to, to come outside because she thought the house was going to collapse. So, I mean, this is, this is one of those, those, one of those basic level things that you learn from travel. You learn what it's like to survive an earthquake. Yeah which is totally exactly. random and totally given to 1994. So like some of the other, like we went to Lollapalooza twice, you know, another, another yep. thing that, that you can't really do anymore. We were watching game five of the NBA playoffs later that year in St. Louis when all of a sudden they cut to the OJ chase, right? Oh, yeah. Um, and and it, I, I wrote a lot about that in my journal, just how, just sort of how flummoxed everyone was. I mean, it, it was it was a big deal in a way that I don't know it would be a big deal now. Were like yeah. Tom Brokaw and Bob Costas were like visibly shaken and and sort of talking about in, in part because there were big crowds of people back in Los Angeles, which by this time we had left, standing on overpasses with signs that said the juice is loose, right? <laughs> and and so it, it was one of those meta media moments that now nobody you know people would be broadcasting in real time on their phone, but at the time, exactly, it was just this inclusive thing. And there were some other 1994 things, like uh, that was the year Kurt Cobain killed himself, um, and yeah. I remember we were in South Carolina, I remember that being very affecting. There's some things, like, I remember when we were standing in line after the Northridge earthquake, there were people on cell phones which were very exotic. Those were like rich people equipment <laughs> at the time, right? The size of a shoebox. Yeah. Right, yeah. Um, and of course, we mailed a lot of postcards. Um, I called home about once a week. Sometimes we yeah. would go to a house and we would look forward to picking up mail. Um, yeah. And one thing, you know, usually we slept in the van, but sometimes we would stay with distant family or friends of friends. And one thing that they would always say to us when we traveled is how bad travelers we were. Because I think when we, when we got to a house, <laughs> we were so excited to not be sleeping in the van that we would watch TV. 
We would sleep <laughs> until noon. We would we would play pool in the basement. You know, we would listen to the, Chicago to the host Barry Manilow albums. So, <laughs> hey, we wanted to experience everybody's homes, including their you know Egyptian cotton sheets and their showers, which which I we mean, appreciated. Come yeah, come on, that's like. That's the best, though. You, you're out there for weeks, and you, you know, you're you're sponge bathing it in a gas station bathroom <laughs> right. to be able to luxuriate in a Brentwood house. Come on, yeah, of course you're gonna enjoy it. It's awesome. I think people were a little startled too by how grateful we were, right? Like yeah, they they weren't yeah. used to like giving somebody a plate of casserole or a shower indoors, and 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 find and just having young men being so excited about it. So. It's a good point. It's a good yeah. point. We appreciated every moment, that's for sure. Especially the uh the homes, the shelter and uh the food. Yeah. Yeah. In in addition to, to it being sort of a nineteen ninety four specific time, it was very much uh, you were twenty one, right? Were you twenty one years old? Yeah, I turned twenty two in uh June of that year. Okay. Yeah, and I was twenty three the whole time. And it's just funny looking back on my journal, how we were really looking through the world through twenty one year old or 21 and 23 year old eyes like people in their mid 30s were old right like like there's so many oh times oh my gosh yes several yeah. of the people in our in our experiences were like oh this old wise person right. i looked them up on facebook and they're like 9 years older <laughs> than me <laughs> well another thing is it's... like like a half a dozen times it's like yeah, some eighteen-year-old girls were flirting with us and we felt really like perverted and now those <laughs> girls are 43 <laughs> They were like three years younger than you and five years younger than me, but they were teenagers. So I felt like it was just inappropriate that these girls who could be in high school, I mean, it was, it was probably good that we kept our distance from high school girls at right. that time. But just, sure. just, just this tone of alarm that I had in my journal when a, a teenage girl would flirt with us was just like, whoa, that's really weird. Oh, yeah. And now it's like, okay, yeah, that, that's a 43-year-old woman now who probably has teenage kids of her, of her own. So Exactly, um, <laughs> exactly. I, I was blown away because on that, on that trip in March, my younger brother turned 17. And, and right now I have a 16-year-old daughter who's going to be 17 next year. Wow. <laughs> it's like, oh, my Lord. But, yeah, the, the recollection of some of these people who were like, like out you know, teaching us all of this wisdom of his years on the sea. Like, that guy's not that much older than us. Right. Just so, and, just, just so my audience know, Al is a guy who took a sailing in Miami in Fort, Fort Lauderdale and was just the coolest guy ever, like a Cuban-American guy. Great guy, really took us under his wing and gave us some advice. Uh, but, yeah, you know, he was probably younger than we are now. Um, exactly. For sure. For yeah. sure. And, and, you know, he had these crazy stories. I mean, what we spent – the entire day on a rented sailboat in the Bay of Biscayne and drinking way too much and just hearing endless stories about his time in the Coast Guard. Mm. And, you know, my, my recollection was this guy was two clicks from Hemingway, right? Right. <laughs> right. He's, he's probably 30, you know, at best. Right. Yeah. No. And, but he taught us like his Coast Guard ship song, which I still know the words to. I, I, I taught it to several people. I, yeah. I think about it often. It's hard to get it out of your brain. So uh, for special uh, bonus for subscribers for Deviate with Rolf Potts, you can get <laughs> Jeff and I singing the North Wind song on another track. We, we, oh, we, we actually, we're the there. men of the North Wind. We're raiders of the night. <laughs> we, we actually sang that in a bar once when you were married, and your wife is like, just never do that again. Never, ever sing yeah, that exactly. song again. I, I, think I, uh, I think I've been tempted to teach that song to my children which i have three <laughs> girls so bad bad idea and uh and was warned to never do that again yeah yeah so it was um one, one funny thing about reading my journal after all this time is that we were fully adult at the time but we were super young adults and so 25 years ago i was 23 years old which means that i had no perspective like 25 years before then, then was two years before I was born, right? That was like the summer mm. of love or something. Um, and so it's it's really strange and, and a little bit, uh, I don't know if moving is the right word, but just, just to see my thoughts as an adult from something that happened such a long time ago, you know, that I, I was a thoughtful guy 
Um, but I was a young, thoughtful guy, and it was just, it, yeah. it's, it's like time travel. And I'll get to this in a second, but like I was, I read my journal in the tone of my 23 year old self with grandparents or aunts who have since passed away. And it really made me miss those people because the tone of, because it, it took me right back to age 23 in this way that, yeah. um, like I thought I was going to write a book about it. I didn't. <laughs> and it's probably just as well. But um, one one blessing of having, and this season we, I did an episode about keeping a travel journal. One blessing of keeping a a, a, a very detailed travel journal is that it'll, it, it, in an almost literal way, allows me time travel now that I can really get into my brain as a 23 year old. So, uh, absolutely. I mean, I've been I've been going through my journal and just blown away at at just the the youthfulness and the immaturity, but also just the the energy that we had and it, you know, as a mid forties, uh, you don't tap into that energy too often. Right. So being able to go back in time and read about it straight, you know, first person is, uh, it's special. So I, I think it is, it's a bit of a time capsule. I'm, I'm worried about that time capsule passing on to my children, but you know, for <laughs> me, it's pretty, it's pretty special to read it and be able to go back. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's, uh, it's interesting how like in this day the you know, part of hashtag van life or even blogging is that there's a very public and performative nature to how people um, record their travels. But there was never an intended audience for these journals, uh, except ourselves. Um, yeah. I, I think you sort of wrote yours in code because you were afraid because you maybe knew you would have daughters <laughs> and you didn't want to give too much details. But um, but uh, that's yeah. been a fun thing about looking at that. So so let's get I've been promising for quite a while now that we're going to get into the, the nitty gritty details. So let's get into some of the nitty gritty yeah. de details, you know. Mardi Gras was the first place, was the first big um, pin in our map, and we had a great time there. And yeah. it was very generic, like sort of all we knew was Bourbon Street. And so like for three days in a row, we went to Bourbon Street, which was just full of people. And we drank, and it was full of people <laughs> like us, like it was full of like 18 to 25 year olds. Um, Bunch of idiots. Yeah, and it's, I don't want to disp disparage my young self too much, but it was just such a knucklehead approach to Mardi Gras. We had a great time, but it was such an uncreative and insipid way to experience Mardi Gras. It was just oh, for sure beads and beers and, and talking to babes, you know? So in spite of uh, the Mardi Gras experience, it was really framed by two less iconic, but much more memorable experiences. One, which is riding with the cops in Houston and yeah. two, which is going to, to Canton Bible Baptist Church and, and helping yeah. out with their housing and racial reconciliation ministry. Um, and so I, I want to I touch on both of these a little bit. Um, and actually, I've, I've written four books as of this recording, and one of them is, is about the Ghetto Boys. And people are confused, like, why I wrote a book <laughs> for the 33 and the third series about the Ghetto Boys, about this very offensive gangster rap group from the 1990s and it's literally because of this trip that you and i when we were roommates in college listened to the ghetto boys in part because it, the music just made us feel uncomfortable in a way that like punk rock and heavy metal couldn't um yeah. and um we only listened to it for a few months but we were so intrigued or at least i was so intrigued by the idea of fifth ward houston um which yeah. sort of seemed like like um something from the lord of the rings like like um you know, Doom Mountain or something, that I just wanted to see it. So I called in. I wasn't sure. Like, I thought if we visited a church or something in, in, in the Fifth Ward, it would be different. It would be a little stilted. So I just called the cops and did a ride along, and we pretended to be aspiring police for an evening. And we drove through the Northeast or Southeast Houston substation. And it was it was so interesting in a way that went beyond the Ghetto Boys and any expectations we could have had of that experience. And I touch on this in the Ghetto Boys book, but if you listen to a gangster rap song, it's going to, it's going to sing about a heightened version of what happens in a, in a poor neighborhood. Uh, and if you watch an episode of Cops, they're going to show this, the highlights of what happens on an average shift of a cop. But hanging with the police for, for a night shift was just fascinating window on, on uh, Fifth Ward, Houston. Well, you just saw people, you know, living their daily lives, people who'd called the police because they were mad at their neighbor uh, or because a drunk guy had his girlfriend's son borrow his car and he hadn't returned it. So he decided to call the cops. Um, and so it was just a really interesting experience. My officer was from uh, was from the area. He was an African-American guy, really fit, um, really competent. 
your officer, Shaky Pete was his nickname. Was Shaky uh, Pete. He, he was uh, he, he was a competent officer, but more of a cowboy. Like he was he wasn't his neighborhood. He was a white guy from outside the neighborhood, and so it's like we we sort of had an interesting perspective on on both views of policing in a place like Fifth Ward. What are your memories of of being in in Fifth Ward, Houston? Yeah, I mean the the Ghetto Boys were an important part of of our college experience, and I still can't forget lyrics to their songs. They were that powerful. Right, And so going to the fifth ward where all of that came from with, with those guys going through that life that we just just to your point is so forward. I mean, you know, and I talked about earlier, like there's no Pacific ocean left to tame and, you know, find the the new world or there's no planet to go discover. That was kind of it for us, right? Like, Oh my gosh, this is a foreign world. This is totally different. Everything in those, those songs like where is this made so i think it was so like alluring for us and then to go do that at the base level of of police you know right wow ride alongs really in the fifth ward the third watch you know the night shift like that is crazy why would we do that i guess it's sort of where our our privilege privilege of age came through in that we didn't go to the cops and say hey we kind of like the ghetto boys can we ride along with you (laughs) We, we sort of let them assume that we were young guys who wanted to become cops. And then yeah, um, that yeah. actually, especially your guy, really sort of was trying to recruit you. Whereas my my yeah. guy, again, he was from the neighborhood. He took me to his mom's house. We ate some greens. You know, he yeah. it, it was a completely different experience. It, it was, I'm sure it was a black-white thing to a certain extent, but it was also a guy who lived there versus a guy who didn't sort of thing. And so For sure. um, my officer knew the the neighborhood a little bit more intimately. Um and it's and it's really interesting how I had completely forgotten we went to Johnson Space Center in Houston. We did like a, a tourist yeah. thing. Um yeah. but, but it just is completely forgettable compared to um having done this ride along just so we could see this place that was seared in our minds like the land of mortar, Fifth Ward Houston, which the ghetto boys <laughs> had us believe was like the land of mortar. And um we did have those and chases through the seats to the streets but there's also like normal people too so it was it was really interesting yeah. and, and and unforgettable and not your normal tourist experience and the other one what i want to bring up is in canton mississippi basically a guy who had spoken at our college um named jasper um ran a ministry there and so we hung out with them for three days right after mardi gras this is this is another thing about 23 year olds like we parted our asses off for three days then we went to a housing ministry in canton mississippi for three days, and we we helped. Uh, they had like a, a ministry where they basically help um, local people build their own houses because they believe that economic independence, you know, starts with home ownership. So we helped build some houses, and then I I did some copywriting for some of their promotional material, and we played a lot of pickup basketball, you know, and um, it, it was just it was the it, it's one thing. I guess had you ever been to the South before? No, I mean I I've been to uh to Miami, which is completely different. Yeah. Yeah, well I think, you know, the United States has a very complicated racial dynamic that can manifest itself anywhere, but it is really weird in the south, right? And yeah. so so Jasper was just this really forward-thinking guy who was a minister who was trying to appeal to the basic needs of his parishioners, but also was was asking himself why don't we have families from from like ten blocks away in the white part of town that we interact with as Christians, right? Um, so it was really interesting, and, it, and it, I, in my journal, I, I found it interesting how entrenched the South is with its um, with its racial attitudes, right? So people were used to white people going to Canton Bible Baptist, but it was always people from the North, like us, who were there basically to help, right? Um, that yeah. s- at least as far as my journal reported, the white people of Canton were really uncomfortable with the black people of Canton uh, in a way that seems a little bit unique to the South. What, what, what do you remember from your experience in Canton? Yeah, it was, it was bizarre. You know, I, I've grown up my entire life in the Pacific Northwest, you know, a, a liberal hotbed and, uh, you know, a, a community that it claims to be pretty diverse. And I, I think 
by diverse, it means we don't have the same history that the South has. And so it's not as close to home and it's segregated in a way that's completely different than, than the South has been segregated um, in a much more passive aggressive way. Cause that's kind of the Pacific Northwest vibe. Right. right. Um, and so when, when we were there in, in Canton, you know, we were on the other side of the tracks to use that, that huh. old cliche. And it was so obvious, right? And it was so, you couldn't be passive aggressive in it. I mean, and like, you know, we had friends in college that were black. We had, you know, a, a pretty open and uh, an accepting community, but we didn't talk about racial issues in the Pacific Northwest, right? Like it right. was almost back then something, you know, that was contained to the South or, or the Watts riots or, you know, not the Pacific Northwest because they were kind of above that. Um, but that, that just meant it wasn't necessarily being addressed. And when you're there in Canton, like it was, it was on the surface, but then we also, I mean, I remember when they, when Jasper and his family and his friends who were like, so, so open to us and, and, and welcoming took us to the seafood buffet to to have real Southern seafood dinner. Mm -hmm. And I swear we were there. I mean, it was like a very European experience. Like, I mean, we talked and laughed and ate like forever. Like it was an all night affair. Um, and it was crazy good food and my cholesterol levels went up for sure. Um, but that was just like, it was such a great experience and exposure to that culture that you just, you never get in the Pacific Northwest. I don't want to speak for Kansas, but you know, that's, this doesn't happen in Seattle. Yeah. I think I grew up in a more racially diverse environment than you, but sort of a Midwestern racially diverse place. You know, it's just, it's just, it's a different vibe than the South. Um, yeah. And one interesting thing that happened is that our entree into the South really was canceled by Canton Bible Baptist Church. And so in this weird way that might be unique to, to young men, in the South, we were suddenly very comfortable around black people. Um, yeah. in a, and, and I remember going, we often went to universities um, to, to go to the library and work on our journals or go to the sports facilities. We went to a Savannah State College <laughs> to go in the library. I bleached my hair. <laughs> Right, and it's a historically black college. Like we're the only white people there, and we just sort of shrugged. And it's like, oh yeah, well, it's, it's young people, and I think I think the Savannah State people were more weirded out than we were. Possibly, oh, for sure. Possibly for because sure. it's the South, you know, and and so it's yeah. just it's not normal. Um, and I don't want to overgeneralize about the South, but this, these are really the impressions that came through in my memory and my journals that that young white dudes just didn't go to Savannah state campus to hang out. <laughs> and so, yeah. Um, so, and, and that, yeah, that might be more acceptable now or more normal now, but, but then it was like, what, what are you doing here? Like you got, you have an agenda or you got cause trouble or, you know, it was, it was, we were definitely, we were definitely odd for being there. Yeah. And so we sort of, it's like, Oh yeah, here's a place full of young people. And the, the, the black folks we hung out with so far have been great. So we'll just exactly. go here. And then, I think, you know, maybe for the first 45 minutes we were there, people just thought, who the hell are these people? <laughs> but we, we worked on our journals and we looked at library books and did the stuff that we normally do. So I think that that was a, a, a couple of, of special experiences that flanked Mardi Gras is that is, is riding with the police in Fifth Ward and really seeing a different side of, of the inner city that we wouldn't have seen as tourists. And then, uh -huh. then hanging out with this black church in the South and really seeing the racial dynamic of the South from the black side, even though we were in no way black people and I couldn't make any claim to the black experience, it's just our entree into that racial dynamic of the South was through yeah. the lens of Jasper, this guy who's trying to change um, the racial dynamic, or at least among Christians in the South. So those those were really special, special times. Um, yeah, I, I, I definitely, that seared into my brain. I even remember going to, to his church and and being exposed to that, you know, that that culture and and the traditional southern church and then i think everybody in the entire church came up to us and like shook our hands and wanted to hug us and like they just wanted to know they were going to be the ones to to come and extend an olive branch hmm. and i swear no none of them left that church without coming to us um you just you know i never experienced that in my life i don't i don't know if too many people have yeah, it was a special time. One funny footnote to that experience is that I was a little bit startled that the choir wasn't very good 
because if you just watch TV, all black choirs are great, right? Like they're, they're, they invented gospel. <laughs> That's right. They're super pitchy. <laughs> and so, so we were sitting in this, and it's like, oh, my God, they're, this choir is as bad as white people. So it's just, it's just funny. It's just those, those little details that stick in your craw. If, if, you've, if, oh, so if, if it's the first time or one of the first times you've ever been the only white person in a black church, then those are the sort of goofy details that stand out to you. So, so funny. Yeah, I, I remember there. I don't know what we were thinking, but like just randomly going to some other church in the South. It was a white church and the different experience where we had a lot of people come up and they were kind of eyeballing us. And then they found out we were OK. And then they give us cash. I, I, <laughs> I put down <laughs> people, people giving us like 20 bucks. She's like, what are you doing? We're going to church every day. This is amazing. I remember that was that was a church in Alabama. I wrote about that in my yeah. journal, too. And again, this is another thing. You know, for van lifers out there, go to church on a Sunday. I mean, why not? I mean, one thing about about the van, the hashtag van life, it's mostly in the West. It's a lot of outdoors people going to beaches and mountains, whereas some of our most memorable experiences were in, in cities and rural oh, yeah. areas in counterintuitive parts. But I remember that church. It was in Alabama. We went to a Bible yeah. study, and we went to a church that had a, had good um, – um, Oh, history of the Bible courses, and so I think some of the people thought we were like ministry students or something because we 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 knew we knew what the parable of the of the Good Samaritan was about, and then then literally they they came up afterwards, and it must be a southern thing, and it was an all white church, but they they literally pressed money into our hands and told us to uh, to go and spread God's love. So that was a uh, what a gig. That was that was an interesting thing, and 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 that what almost. A gig. I think we. Yeah, I think we invested that 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 hard-earned cash in Southern Comfort, so it was right. well well deserved. Oh dear, yeah. So we we actually we could have gone from New Orleans straight into Florida, and I want to get to Florida in a second. But we actually took a little curly cue through the South, and it was worth it for these reasons. You know, a, a white church versus a black church. They were both positive experiences. We went to some Civil War battlegrounds. Um, we went. I remember hanging out at the University of Northern Alabama. And just as we did with a lot of different colleges and just sort of talking to, to young people, which was great in a way that goes beyond all the stereotypes of, of a certain region of the United States. Um, but after we got to, went to the South, went to Florida, and it's the only state in the United States that we stayed in for a month. We spent the entire month of March in Florida. <laughs> Yeah, we used we used that month well though. We we saw the the whole thing and uh, had some amazing experiences. I don't think we had a, a single rinse and repeat day. It was spring break the entire month we were in Florida, and we were you were technically still in college, and I was one year out of college. And we had two memorable spring break experiences. One was in Panama City Beach, which is the Redneck Riviera. Um, which which was sort of the generic Mardi Gras experience, like we we drank too much and and you know talked to girls and and did Jello shots probably. Whereas whereas we went down to Key West, we checked into the Key West Youth Hostel, and um, we met these girls who were staying in or these young women, these young college girls who were staying in the in the attached motel, and they invited us to to um, to hang out with them. And we sort of had this summer camp love affair with these three girls from, who went to college in Florida, um, where we wandered off to the beach uh, independently of each other, and we came back and realized that the three of us had sort of paired off with three best friends um, who were going to school in Orlando and were going to spring break in Key West. Um, I was sort of smitten with, with my girl, Val. She actually met us at a couple of different of places during the trip. And, and I'll come back to that later just because, again, these weren't girls that we, that we necessarily had a future with. But it wasn't sort of a weird predatory hookup thing e either. It was, just, it was this delightful, delightful connection um, with, these, with these girls who seemed younger. I remember in the journal saying – Wow, these girls have all so much energy. They're like 19, 20 years old. And it's like, yeah, we're we're 21, 23 years old. <laughs> That's <the> old parts. <laughs> it was sort of like an intermingling of dreams. Um yeah. that we were, you know, attracted to each other and we were spending time together and we were just having very goofy experiences together, but we got energy from them and they got energy from us in that the future was bright and unseen at that moment. And we were young yeah. enough that there was no pressure to figure out what exactly the future of these relationships were. They were just these, these goofy relationships with three 
girls who had great chemistry with each other and, and you and me and Lauren who had a, a friendship that went back a long time. And it was yeah. just, it was time six, you know, it was, it was whatever happens on, exactly. on spring break <laughs> time six. It was just such a delightful exactly. time. One place that I had never been before, I'm not sure if you went there with your family or not, was New York. Had you been in New York City before? Yeah, we had, but literally for a hot minute, I think it was one of those like, oh my gosh, can you imagine going to New York City in the middle of summer with four kids? So oh, yeah, right. I imagine, I, my, my recollection of it was in and out really quick, like we maybe spent half a day. Um, so New York was, I mean, that was one of those destinations when we had originally talked about the trip where it was like, Oh yeah, stuff's gonna change when we go to New York. This is gonna be a big deal. It's kind of the center of the world. Yeah, and and in in 1994, New York still had a bad reputation. Um, yeah. And and in fact, when we had a great time in New York, we stayed at the Vanderbilt yeah. Y on 42nd Street, I think. <laughs> um, Who doesn't when they go to New York stay at the Vanderbilt Y? <laughs> right. It was it was it was like eighteen dollars a night. We parked the van in Jersey because we were afraid to park it in New York. It was probably a good idea that we did that. <laughs> and we were cheap. Right. And we were cheap for sure. We took the path train into New York. And I remember being completely gobsmacked that every single street was full of people. We would turn a quarter a corner and there'd be like 100 people on the next block and then 100 people on the next block when we got oh. out of the, the subway at Midtown Manhattan. And despite staying at the Y, do you remember the first person we met on the subway in New York and what his profession was? Oh, my gosh. I, I... No, Rolf, you're you're memory is just prolific i can't remember those details i i need to dust off the journal i didn't read the new york section so no we met a uh... we met a porn star named tony mansfield (laughs) (laughs) that this this is this is how awesome new york is is that we were on the subway and it was our first time ever on the subway i think and we were trying to go to the village and this guy just started talking to us and you know despite the stereotype that New Yorkers are standoffish. This guy just started talking to us. I'm here, oh, you're a movie buff. And he's here, I've been in one of the most famous movies, porn movies of all time. I was in Debbie Does Dallas. It was like a famous 1970s or 80s porn movie. And this guy was just sort of talking to us about it as if he was talking about working at the gas station or at, you know, Bear Stearns or something. And so that was the first guy we met. That's the first guy we met in New York City. Wow, nice memory. Yeah. And we walked around the city and just soaked it in. And actually, I, I, I remember this because it was in my journal that you didn't like New York at first. You thought that people shouldn't live this way. And the, <laughs> it, it was just too many people stacked on top of each other. And then one day, I think I was taking a nap and you went for a run. And you decided to run to Central Park from 42nd Street and not move out of the way for anyone as you ran up yeah. Fifth Avenue or something. And that's I how you made... embraced my inner New Yorker. Yeah, and you you made peace, at least according to my journal, you made peace with New York, and um, you were cool with it. So, Yeah, I, I, ironically, I get back to New York, you know, a couple times a year, and it, it is, it's a, it's a coat you wear when you go there. You got to protect yourself, and uh, it makes you actually enjoy the city more. Hmm. If you're, if you're to Seattle, it is, a, it's an overwhelming place, right, because you can go blocks and blocks without really seeing the sky or the horizon, which is just never happens in Seattle, right? We're surrounded by ocean and mountains. And, uh, you know, that, that to me was super intimidating, you know, just even physically. And then obviously the, the social aspect of it, it's not that it's not that New Yorkers are standoffish to your point at all. They're just, completely the opposite people from the westerners and the Mm. the northwesterners that i've i've always grown up with but you know if you can you can embrace your inner new yorker it's a a hell of a city i actually i actually kind of love it now yeah and and we did we did we went up the the empire state building we we went on the conan o'brien show um we did some touristy things but i think some of my favorite things were just sort of walking around the village drinking beer out of sacks um Tompkins Square Park, which is now sort of a nice little park with a dog run, um, was had homeless people living in it in 1994. I think I feel like if we would have just bought real estate in 1994, we'd be we'd be oh, in, in that neighborhood. We'd be living large right, right now. Actually, New York 
eventually became one of my favorite cities. I, I liked it at first, and now it's one of my favorite cities in the world, and I and I go there every year. But it, it's funny, yeah. you know, some some people live in New York and and consider it the center of the world. I was 23 and I'd never set foot in the city before, but th- that was a very important visit that we had. Actually, I'm I'm going to skip ahead a li- now to another important visit we had, which could be one of the most unique things we did on the trip, which is that we visited a Trappist monastery in in Spencer, mm-hmm. Massachusetts. Um, called St. Joseph's Abbey. And I'm not, it was my idea, and I, I forget exactly where I got the idea. Um, I think I think maybe I was in Blue Highways, I think that um, that William Lee's Teep Moon spent some time at a Trappist monastery, and I think I had read some Thomas Merton. Um, but it was, it was, there was a funny dynamic, because I think you weren't 100% sure you wanted to go to a monastery, right? And so... <laughs> Like I very earnestly called the the main monk and tried to explain how no we're not Catholic, yes we're twenty three and twenty one years old, no we're not weirdos you know Zen people or anything we're just sort of curious, and so we went there and basically I was trying to sell Father David on the fact that we should be there and you're like yeah whatever and I think he sort of liked you better because. <laughs> Because you were, I think you were being more real about it. I, I wrote in my journal, I could say that I'm looking for answers, but I don't think answers exist. Answers mollify and inhibit action. I'm looking for ideas that I can convey into action or create new questions with. I don't want to put me in the monastery so much as I want to take some of the monastery out and put it in me. So I had a very, I had very abstract notions, but I mean, that's a pretty sincere thing to write. You know, the idea that I wasn't really there for explicitly religious reasons, but I wanted to spend some time with people who lived in a way that would be unfathomable to most Americans. Yeah. Um, so after after trying to sell the monks on the experience, not only did they, they didn't put us in the guest house, they put us in the contemplation house, which is a yeah. special cottage for people who are considering being monks. And that was extraordinary. And that was a master stroke on their part. Because to this day, this is one of the most memorable experiences I had. And I, I'm, I'm sure of all the van life people out there, very few people end up staying at monasteries. And why should they? I, you know, I wouldn't want to promote this as a tourist destination. But it was just so extraordinary to live in this convention. I think the monks liked us the best. There was, there was three other guys who were staying in the contemplation house. One was a guy who was divorced and obviously was at a very extreme moment and was never going to become a monk. One was a young guy about our age who was a, so like a super Catholic and was going to become maybe a Franciscan, which is sort of like a priest, but not a monk, right? Because these were Trappist monks. Trappist monks like are basically have a vow of silence and, 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 and stay, live isolated lives where Franciscans will work with the poor and stuff. And then this dude named, gosh, I forget his name now, but he had been in the Navy and he had, he's covered in tats and he was sort of into Zen Buddhism. Yeah. And he was really cool. He taught me the phrase, which I use all the time now, which is memento mori, which is uh, the Latin phrase, which remember death or remember you will die. And he was probably the most sincere guy that we hung out with. Even though he was like us, he wasn't traditionally Catholic. He was really exploring the questions of existence while he was there. And um, in our routines, we didn't really cross paths with him very much, even though I think we ate dinner with him sometimes. The monks basically, they put us to work. We, we sheared sheep, we pruned trees, and we'd both been landscapers, so we were expert uh, tree pruners. <laughs> we, worked, well we, we cleaned windows, we worked in the little incense factory, um, and we sort of lived kind of like monks, maybe like 30% like monks for the few days that we were there. And it was this really extraordinary experience. What do you remember of being on, at the monastery? Yeah. Wow. That it was an important week. I think we did almost a full week. And, um, I think that was one of our principles too. We, we didn't want to spend more than five days in any one place. So we kind of capped it at that, but I, I did push against it. I, I mean, you know, I was all up for having crazy new experiences, but the monastic life was never something I wanted to contemplate. So going there for a week kind of sounded like torture. Um, you know, the, the, Rumors of getting up at three in the morning, you know, yeah. clearly there's, there's not a lot of women there. Like there were all <laughs> sorts of reasons not to be intrigued. And the monks, um, the monks so, did get up at three in the morning every day. So, yeah, yeah, it was, it was amazing. But I, I, I do remember that vividly. 
ironically though, is like black and white. And I think you actually took photographs in black and white there, but I, I think I have one that's in black and white, but it's kind of a black and white experience because it was very, um, it was obviously it's monastery. It's very contemplative and, and very silent. And we felt awkward and out of place quite a bit there. Um, but then also appreciated and loved and kind of felt like these guys wanted to talk to us and hear what in the world we were doing. And um, I think we had a couple of those moments where, you know, you could see the monks in in their solitude and in their vows of silence that all of a sudden would break out and talk to you because they had a choice to or a chance to with the, the task they were telling you to do. And you could just tell they had a million things to talk about. Um, but I remember one of the brothers that uh, had been in seclusion in what is a several hundred acre type of estate. He was in the far corner in a cabin by himself for 10 years wow. and, um, and having a chance to talk with him because he was, he was the keeper of the sheep and he taught me how to shear sheep, um, which is something I'm, I'm grateful for not still knowing how to do. <laughs> um, but at the time it was, it was, wow, here's this, this man who, who's been secluded and, and, you know, in prayer, and in contemplation and, you know, doing things like literally praying for, you know, the, the poor in Malaysia for days and weeks. I mean, like just the experience that that man had in 10 years of his life. And then now he's back and he's doing something like shearing sheep every day. Um, and, and just having a chance to talk to him and then experience the whole thing. They, they definitely had us in a different house, but they, what they brought us into every single aspect of their life even one morning asking us if we wanted to get up at three 30 and do prayers with them. So what a crazy, crazy experience. Not, not at all Mardi Gras um, or New York, but wow. What a, what a compliment to the, the crazy array of things we did. Well, I think I counted and it was like 10 days after Philly, we went to the monastery. So like, <laughs> 10 days after we're doing Jaeger shots and waking up and I'm not being facetious when I say this, it's just, it's literally, that's how you, you absorb life when you're, when you're that age is that it didn't seem that weird to suddenly be waking up at three in the morning for religious services at a monastery. We were just soaking it all in. And I actually wrote down to, to your point of what you were just talking about, like with a hermit monk, father David said something that I wrote down in my journal. He says in America, monasticism is seen as strange and it is not understood. This is a pragmatic and materialistic society that does not understand an activity, does not prove that does not produce something tangible. And so, I mean, that's why you have this this hermit monk who's praying for the world and shears sheep. And, you know, the the the, the secular world in America just wouldn't understand what the what the point is for that, you know, um, yeah. And then it's funny how all the monks had different personalities. Actually, you know, like Father David was was the alpha. There was a reason why he was in charge of yep. the visitors because he was he was a little bit stern and a little bit skeptical of us. I, he, he liked you because you admitted that when you mowed the lawn, they had you on on, on landscaping duty, and you would sing and yell to yourself. <laughs> and so he just thought that was so honest that in a place where people have vows of silence, that of course the guest the guest would be polite enough to scream and yell when the lawnmower is on. But like, that's a true fact. I was I was packing incense with Brother Damien, and he just he was maybe twenty eight, and he just talked. He just talked the whole time. He was a guy who had taken a vow of silence, <laughs> but was clear clearly dying to talk. I love it. And then there was a guy named Father Paulinus. I don't know if I don't know if he's yes, the same as the Paul Herm and Paulinus. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I don't know if we pruned with him or we sheared sheep with him, but he talked about how he was dying to sneak out of the monastery and get an ice cream. Um, and I, I just thought these monks were the funniest, most delightful people that like all of them had a vow of silence and, a, and contemplation. All of them got up at three o'clock in the morning to pray and they sang yeah. those classic monastic chants. You know, I think in the early nineties, there was an, there was a best-selling album of, of, of Trappist monks singing, but they all had their own personalities. You know, there, there's this guy who, oh, um, for sure. like, um, what was it? One of them made a joke. We were, we were cleaning windows. I don't know. He he just made a joke about how that was his vision of hell was was cleaning the windows in the refractory or wherever we were. Um, <laughs> but it was it was such it was such a unique experience. And and to this, I think I internalized it. I think it made me comfortable with being alone and contemplative and not being productive. Right. About yeah. being alone with your thoughts. And I think it's a good lesson 
Now in the in the information age, in the smartphone age, where when we have a, a, a silent moment to ourselves, the instinct is to look at our smartphone or to, to bring up our laptop. But to think of the spiritual benefits of just turning inward, contemplating on the divine and the eternal, um, is extraordinary. I wrote in my journal that Compline was my favorite service. There was like five different mm. services every day, and I forget what it was called at the 3 a.m. one. We only did that once, and that was really hard to That's do. That's called a hell. <laughs> right, right. Yep. It, it was so, it was so, it was so 330, early. 330 vigils in the chapel. Vigils, yeah. Do you have a schedule? Yeah. Do, you, do you have it in your journal? No, I just, I just pulled up my journal to that okay. day, um, May 20th. Yeah. And uh, yeah, 330 vigils. What in the world? We had to get up at three o five a.m. Wow, that's just crazy. I think that that's about when we uh, we averaged going to bed in Florida. Yeah, yeah, and it was that was way before our bedtime in in Philadelphia. So, um, <laughs> but I wrote in my journal that Compline is my favorite. Compline is the sunset service. Mm. It's dark. Oh, the, right. the songs, even the Lord's Prayer, are contemplative and almost sad and mournful. I don't understand the words. Mm. But it feels like a celebration at the end of the day. The setting sun illuminates the western stained glass, a multicolored gel, in an otherwise dark hall that illuminates a stone angel with a tablet with an omega symbol. And so it sounds like every day at sunset they had compline. They didn't turn on the lights inside the chapel. So basically we're listening to these Gregorian chants in the dark with the sunset brilliantly illuminating this stained glass window. And again, it's even even in 1994, before the the smartphone era, when when distraction is sort of the the default setting, there was something extraordinary about all of these monks being centered in the spiritual world, singing together at the end of the day. It was it was just one of the most extraordinary moments of of the trip, really. I love it. Yeah, there, I think there were many moments like that where, I mean, we were just out in this incredible you know pristine instagram worthy setting with rolling hills and sheep and you know stone buildings that were hundreds of years old and uh and you know deeply deeply contemplative people um and and it was a, a whole different level that it brought us to in our experience of i don't want to say peace but you know peace calm and uh and, a, and an ability to be at a different pace and uh, and be okay with it. It was pretty special. Yeah, I think it also goes to show that you can learn lessons, important lessons, contemplative lessons, without being all or nothing about it. Because we were doing mm -hmm. Jaeger shots 10 days before St. Joseph's <laughs> Abbey, and we were drinking beers like three days after St. Joseph's <laughs> Abbey. That we were We were very much young men. We were very earnest about everything, but... We weren't going to let the fact that we were very moved by a monastery, you know, keep us from from drinking beers when we were in Boston or or hanging out with our friend Steve, a third friend who came to see us in the, in in the Northwest or in the Northeast, actually. Um, so so it's interesting how this that one five day four or five day experience of the monastery was affecting in a way that I can still feel now. Yet it didn't it didn't stop us from doing Jello shots like a week and a half later. <laughs> Pots, we were clearly all about balance. <laughs> I think so. And, and one, one other balance factor I want to bring in is the fact that we, we spend a lot of time in national parks. And if you look at the hashtag van life, a lot of it has to do with the outdoors. And, of course, living in a van really forces you to be outdoors. And we haven't talked about national parks very much yet. But we think about national parks being a part of the American West. But we saw so many cool places in the south. Wow. And in the Northeast, like we went yeah. rock climbing and rafting in North Carolina. We hung out in Ocala National Par uh, Forest in Florida. We, we, we hiked into the Shenandoah National Park Wilderness in, I think, Virginia, and just had this amazing yeah. experience by, by a river for a few days. And we read books yeah. and just sort of let time stand still. You know, we both sort of grew up in the West. I, I'm from the Midwest, but I went to college in the West. You're entirely from the West. And I think sometimes yeah. you... The parks and the mountain ranges are so big out west that sometimes you can forget that there are beautifully, absolutely stunning places in the south and the east and the yeah. northeast. And so Shenandoah was, was absolutely fantastic. And then when yeah. we went up into New England, a place that I thought, you know, like you can fit all of New England into Idaho, right? Like how <laughs> what could possibly be there to find in, in New England? I remember... 
Vermont being so beautiful in May that I almost felt like crying, you know, it was just so green yeah. and the roads were like yeah. small through these, these little houses. We went and we climbed Mount Washington in New Hampshire with our friend, Steve. And we, we sort of have, um, we have less crazy stories about Steve visiting us because Steve actually had a job. Like he knew what he wanted to do <laughs> with his life at age 22. Our other two friends didn't know yet. And so Steve was by far, and it shows in my journal, the most responsible friend who went with us. But we climbed Mount Washington the week that, the, which is uh, this the tallest mountain in, in New Hampshire, I think. Um, yeah. It's very popular among snowboarders. And we climbed it the weekend that they opened the, the motor road to the top. Uh, and so we were like the very last climbers of the winter season. And then we came back down to this shelter. And it's one thing to go camping in the American West, but in the shelter... And this is straight from my journal. There was two dudes from Massachusetts who brought 50 pounds of steak. <laughs> there was three dudes from New Jersey who brought a case of bud and no sleeping bags and just left in the middle of the night and left us the bud. And then yep. there's these dudes yep. from New Haven, Connecticut, who showed up with five gallons of beer, um, a boom box, uh, like a pint, like um, a fifth of tequila and an ounce of weed. <laughs> and I think they were wearing jeans jackets, right? Like they brought. They, right, exactly. They brought yeah. sleeping bags. North face. But they were like sort of mullet and mustache, like jeans jackets guys. And you just got this collection of characters who you would never meet at a campsite, it feels like, in the West. And because these guys had an ounce of weed and all this booze, we were like the most popular hut on the mountain. And it, it was just it was just an absolutely delightful night that I never would have guessed that there would have been this crazy wild mountain um, in the Northeast. In fact, the, uh, I think more people die on Mount Washington than most any other mountain in America. There's all these little, you know, people dying in snowboarding accidents and falling off cliffs and stuff. And so it felt really wild in New England in a way that I had no idea to expect. Yeah, I wasn't prepared for it either. And that like potpourri of crazy people in, in that lean to was something I'd actually never experienced before. All of my experiences in the West camping prior to that were tent and, uh, you know, open, open back country. So that was, that was just forced socialization of a bunch of crazy people. I love that guy with like 50, 50 pounds of beer. And who does that? Who hikes the 12, 12,000 feet up? Dudes, dudes, dudes from Boston oh. and New Haven, I guess. It was, Genius, man. But the, the great He's thing, immortal. The great thing about the huts is, that, again, it, tents are very personalized. You may socialize around the campfire like we did in the oh. American West, at the national parks in the American West, but then you go back to your tent. Whereas in this place, you're there with the party guys who brought 50 yeah. pounds of steak. You're with the guys who brought all the tequila and the weed. And it was – such it was again sort of like in philly it's these these northeastern guys who just have a completely different view of the world but were totally hospitable totally cool guys and in their own way really tough like they like climb yeah. this mountain in jeans jackets and they'd hiked yeah, that's... all this beer it was it was delightful yeah, that, it was delightful yeah we i think we had a couple of those park-based social experiences like that like some we brought our party with us and, and, you know, had friends, et cetera, or met friends there. Others we met like Moab, total strangers, right. In the middle right. of the desert. Um, and, and obviously Mount Washington was, was epic, but we had, we had several of those of people you meet. I remember Yellowstone or Glacier, just meeting, meeting a guy on the trail who had like a 95 pound pack who yeah. been backcountry for the max permit of like 30 days. <laughs> he was yeah. on like day 22. And uh, wow. Yeah. You meet some amazing people out there. That guy was awesome. He was so, he was so weird. I think he was from Brooklyn or something. And he had, he had fallen in love with the wilderness. He had like 10 pounds of peanut butter. He was such a yeah. stranger. And he's here like, yeah, I like bird watching. And I'm like, oh, what do you do when you're bird watching? And he's like, well, you look at birds. <laughs> 
it was, and the great, oh, well said. The great thing about Glacier, and I'll, I'll just fold in the the parks of the American West, um, since we're talking about the wilderness, is that um, the great thing about Glacier is that it's full of bears, right? It's it's full of yeah. I th- maybe grizzly bears or brown bears. Yeah. And so number one is everybody is worried about them, and two, everybody talks about them. Like you run into somebody in Glacier National Park, and you're you're going to eventually talk about bears. Well, this guy, the guy with the yep. fifty pound pack. Like a few days before, he 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 was so worried about the bears eating his peanut butter that he strung his pack fifty feet in a tree, and then like couldn't figure out how to get it down. And he oh, and he and he had to camp there for like two more days while he figured out how to get his pack down. That guy was just delightful. He was just again he he seemed super old, but maybe he was like thirty two or thirty eight or right, something. Right, exactly. He was like a day trader who burned out at thirty three <laughs> years old. Yeah. Uh, so and, we had we had some amazing experiences of, of just really really random people. I mean, the Moab one too. I haven't even read this recently, but it's still seared in my brain. Like these serial like predators, it, you know, who are going to these social hostels or lean tos to just meet young girls mm-hmm. um, and and impart their their wisdom on young men. I, I remember this guy who looked like he was straight out of a movie, you know, bald and like maybe he had a patch on his eye or a scar of some sort. I don't know. It's it's become much more epic in my memory. Uh, but I mean, he was just, you know, he was telling us stories about, you know, grabbing rattlesnakes and, you know, being out in the desert for weeks. And um, yeah, I mean, you just can't, you can't meet those people if you're stuck in a tent. There's no doubt. Yeah, I remember we met them at a youth hostel, and there was there were three girls that we ended up hanging out with: Melanie, Louisa, and then I forget the name of the third girl. Nice. And and like all the guys were were hitting on him. Like the rattlesnake guys were sort of hitting on the girls, and then there's some sort of <laughs> frat broy guys who moved in too. Like I, I think cute young girls are a little bit of a, a rare commodity in in, in national park areas. <laughs> it's like seeing a grizzly. <laughs> right. And for for whatever reason, we seemed upstanding enough that Louisa and Melanie and their friend wanted to hang out with it, with us. And so yeah. we hiked through Arches National Park, which is Edward Abbey territory. We both read Desert Solitaire when Beautiful. we were there. And yeah. it's just a delightful book. I'll put that in the show notes. Desert Solitaire by Edward Abbey is just a fantastic American work of nonfiction. But these girls were from Connecticut. And... They were again. They were so delightful. The Eastern versus Western Americas, and, and this is a this is a quote from my journal because we we hiked with them at Moab, then we we went to a diner and then we camped together. We went to Fisher's Towers, which is like this wildy coyote area BLM land, and then so we just hung out with them for a long time. And it was again, it was like being from girls from another country. And so it says the girls were joking about <laughs> wanting a Coke machine, about how they were missing their soap operas. The girls are afraid of coyotes. The girls are afraid of lightning that is 40 or 50 miles away. They miss home. (laughs) They are confused and lonely sometimes. Louisa is looking at sandstone cliffs like clouds, finding scenarios like in a Rorschach. Girls realize that they could come west and wait tables and play around. Louisa says she wants to fly, not for spiritual reasons, because she doesn't want to walk. (laughs) Louisa says... deep. Louisa says, in the East, we don't use North and South. We use up and down. <laughs> oh, wow. Jersey Shore. So, so these girls, up and down. they chose us for some reason, and we hung out with them. We, like, swam in rivers. Again, it was, it was like this primeval land-before-time type adventure where we're just in this beautiful part of Utah with these Connecticut girls who seem, like, a little bit like they're from another planet. Um, and <laughs> they were. we're swimming in rivers and, and sitting by campfires. And it was just, it was one of those things. Had we not stayed at a hostel that night, we never would have met them. Had we been sleeping in the van, yeah. we wouldn't have met these delightfully strange girls from, uh, from Connecticut. So yeah. Hostels. What a, what a great invention. Yeah. And you know, we read Edward Abbey when we were in, um, when we were in Utah, when we were in Arches. And I think, I hope that young travelers still have a relationship to books that we did. Because we weren't, yeah. we weren't huge readers, but we, I remember in Florida, you got a copy of On the Road 
and you were talking to the guy who was selling it, and he gave he sold it to you like for a quarter because quote you yeah. were living it right. So you you basically <laughs> got an almost free copy of On the Road, and yeah. you, you like you read The Razor's Edge by Mom and really liked it. And when I was in that one, that one, that one blew me away on the road. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, and it's and it's not like we were super sophisticated literary guys, but somehow we knew that books would be an important part of the journey. And so when I was in Missoula, Montana, I bought a beat up copy of Leaves of Grass. And it blew my mind. And if anyone who's read Vagabonding will know that I am smitten with Walt Whitman yeah. because he's, I quote him so much in Vagabonding. And really, it's a love affair. Even though I studied him in college, it's a love affair that started in Missoula, Montana, where I got this book. And this is I'm quoting him. I, I like this poem. It's, song of, it's, a, it's a verse from Song of the Open Road. I think it's part four. I liked it so much that I wrote the whole stanza in my journal. It says, The earth expanding right hand and left hand, the picture alive, every part in its best light, the music falling where it is wanted, stopping where it is not wanted, the cheerful voice of the public road, the gay, fresh sentiment of the road. O oh, highway I travel, do you say to me, do not leave me? Do you say to me, venture not, if you leave me, you are lost? Do you say, I am already prepared, I am well beaten and undenied, adhere to me? O oh, public road, I say back that I am not afraid to leave you, yet I love you. You express me better than I can express myself. You shall be more to me than my poem. And so I was just, I was, it's like Leaves of Grass spoke to me exactly. You know, Song of the Open Road was like, was like the poem of our trip, even though it was 150 years old. Um, and I just loved it so much. And for me to not bring up some of these books that we that we uh, that we fell in love with on the road would be selling it short because it was just such an essential part of our journey. I think. Oh, absolutely. I I know. Uh, I don't know if it was Baltimore, where we had a conversation about Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance being like the most purchased and least read book in the history of of books, <laughs> huh. and so I. I I don't know if whoever we were with, I don't even remember because so many great people, but got the copy for free and started reading it. Was it, was it Pat and Andy Brown? Was it my former high school maybe, English teachers? Maybe, maybe it was them. Yeah, yeah. Maybe it was them. And they're like, okay, well this, if you're going to take this challenge, you have to read it and you can have this book for free. Uh -huh. Um, and, and I mean that book, yeah, that's just crazy. Of course I had to read it. I read it all the way and, uh, read it back and forth several times, but, um, yeah, that that couldn't have been a better book to read on the road, um, you know, with with the you know maybe the exception of of uh, Kerouac as well. But those those were incredibly um, in the moment types of books to be reading while we were living that life. Yeah, I remember you really being moved by that and by by Razor's Edge. You know that that really spoke to you, and I think it was. It was when we got back to the American West, when we'd slowed down and we were out of the van, we were spending a lot of time in the back country, we were doing a lot of hiking, we were spending a lot of time in contemplation that those books really spoke something special to us, I think. Yeah, yeah, they sure did. Absolutely. I, uh, I think they, they were timely and, uh, and we were also open to it, right? Because we weren't in a rush and, you know, we had that ability to, you know, go hike and then sit and read. And, you know, we weren't, we weren't trying to do anything else that was not to pick on social media, but that was Instagram worthy. We, we didn't really have any perspective of what other people would think. We were just kind of there to experience it ourselves. Yeah. yeah. I feel like it's a blessing that we didn't have the option of broadcasting on social media. Um, oh gosh, what a, that would be such a, a weight. And, uh, you know, God forbid if you were like filming stuff that I was doing. I mean, that yeah. would have just changed everything. <laughs> well, the pressure, yeah. one, we probably wouldn't have gone to places. Like we may have gone to Canton Bible Baptist to just sort of show off that we're like good Christians or racially sensitive or something, but we wouldn't have experienced it in the same way. We wouldn't have gone to the monastery, which I think influenced a lot of the things that happened later, like all the contemplative yeah. stuff. And yeah. instead of just sitting in the grass... Well, actually, I'll, I'll read you a little bit, this, this perfect moment. It's, it's when Val, the, the, the girl that I was sort of smitten with, the one that I met in Florida, and, mm. and, and never fully forgot, even though I had little certs encounters with other girls on the trip. Um, she came, she and a friend visited us in, in uh, Wyoming, and we went to Yellowstone together. And it's just, it's this passage 
in my journal just reminds me of the beauty, the beauty of travel, but the beauty of travel at a certain time in your life. And it says, we go out into the meadow, strip down and swim in the cold lake. We're at Wolf Lake in, uh, in Yellowstone Park at this point. And we stretch out in the tall grass, our bodies tingling with the icy electricity of the water, the sun warming us back up. I hold Val close to me, looking at the sky, and all I can see is, is clear blue blades of grass in the face of this girl. We lay there, all of us, for a very long time, and no one wants to move or talk. It's a perfect moment. This moment, future uncertain but unimportant, I will hold all the beauty there is to be felt, experienced in life, right here. Four creatures on this patch of ground at this spot on the rotating earth under the sun. I have been riding on this spinning globe all my life, but now is the time to realize that and to celebrate that simple moments don't last forever. We hike back to the camp in the dark and stoke the fire and tell stories about old Christmas presents and teenage parties. We share the mythology of our suburban childhoods. We decide to stay up late until midnight and sing in August, our seventh month on the road. It's amazing. We try to sing Auld Lang Syne, but none of us know the words. So, so just imagine, That's beautiful. Had, had we been compelled to, to Instagram that, you know, where, where we, we hike miles into the Yellowstone wilderness, we jump in a lake, we crawl out of the lake, and we just lie in the grass together and just breathe in a moment. And then we hike back in the dark, build a fire, and fail to sing Auld Lang Syne because it's August 1st, 1994. Um <laughs> That's such a, and you know, my, my journal rendering of that moment is a little bit overwrought a little bit, but it was just so full of feeling. Like I realized how important those moments are. And I hope that people, yeah. especially young people who are having trips like this uh, in this day and age, allow themselves to have those moments where they just experience them. You know, they don't put them on social media. They don't share them with strangers. They just lie there with the three people that they've come with and they breathe in and they look at the grass and they look at the sky and they feel the water drying off their skin because that just feels so important and so essential. And reading that bit from my journal just makes me realize what a blessing that whole year was. Oh, yeah. Well said. You should be a writer, man. You're really good at that. <laughs> that was uh, that that was also I mean, there's there's so many moments you can't you can't pick them. But, you know, that that was one seared in my brain as well or in my heart that was so that was so unique and so special and and such a um the world exists for the four of us type of moment i mean we saw five feet away giant moose on the on the trail in um you know we we had to figure out how to build a fire because there were some issues with lighters that we lost like i mean there there was just and then that lake i think i was just looking for it, it was wolf lake mm -hmm. um Wolf Lake was like made for us. Like it was the perfect just temperature and experience like that, that whole evening. We're, we're the only people there. Um, the only people in this, you know, entire, and it's really, this is the middle of summer. How did that happen in Yellowstone? Like that never happens. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that was, that was such a special time with, with people that, that were special. That's a, another, another moment too, which speaking of, of all of our time in the great outdoors, you remember watching, fireworks from above at oh. like 11,000 feet on the 4th of July. And we could hear a time delay. I think it was the air force Academy where it, we were a couple thousand feet above. It was, it was Pike national forest. It's near where I worked as a, as a summer camp counselor when That's I was right. a teenager, it was a place called dead man's point, which is up in the mountains. And the air force Academy is down on the plains down in Colorado Springs. And every year on the 4th of July, they have fireworks. And so we went to Dead Man's Point, and we could hear, like, the John Sousa um, tuba music coming up from down, but it, there was, a, like, a time delay. The Sousa music was coming up late, and so were the firework noises. And so we would see a burst, which looked like a little pink glowing spider on the ground because the fireworks were bursting below us. Um, and then we would hear it burst, like, three seconds later and hear this crazy – Philip Sousa music and that this was one of and so many of these happened in the American West one of these perfect wilderness moments and obviously it, it was wilderness bumping up against civilization and then, <laughs> th then when we hung out with the girls in Yellowstone it was wilderness you know bumping up against people but yeah. um there, there were just so many times where it's just like 
you sort of pinch yourself moments where it's like, I can't believe this is happening, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and there's places we didn't even know about. Like we went to the U Uintah National Forest in Utah, um, All right. which is apparently the only east-west mountain range in, in the Rockies. And we just we just hiked there, and it was it was just all new. It was it was a hundred percent brand new. And in fact, I, th I think I have a quote here that, uh, from the, my journal from the Uintas, where I say that I'm, I'm I'm reflecting. Like late in the trip, I was very reflective. I was 23 years old and trying to figure out what to do with my life. But I said the trip is not a pill to take to avoid midlife doubt. It is a flowing of time, a magnification of land and details, and the slow dance of chance. I think I was sort of smitten that we were in this beautiful place. As the sun goes away and we can barely see anything anymore, Jeff notices that my skin is peeling, falling onto the floor of the tent in gray, ashy flakes. You're molting, he says. Yeah, I reply, but into what? <laughs> so so I just I just love this, that I was just I was um I was just smitten with this place and it was tied into my place in life, you know, that I was yeah. that I felt like I was changing, I felt like I was really connected to to America and to the world and to the, my future but in a way that I had no idea what was at stake and it was it was yeah. beautiful This has been Deviate with Rolf Potts. More about everything that was just mentioned can be found in the show notes at rolfpotts.com slash deviate. And as always you can contact me with insights or questions at deviate at rolfpotts.com this episode was produced by Justin Glow. Cedar Van Tassel does the theme music. Thanks for listening, and I hope you tune in for future episodes of Deviate with Rolf Potts. Mm -hmm.